that agreement when I signed on. Yeah. Oh, okay. You don't have a computer in the other room anymore? No, I've got two computers. Do you not see the other one? Um, Is no, this I coming? Can't. It should yeah, be coming one through. Of them, one of them is muted. And so you don't yeah. act. I muted one because otherwise they'd feed back off of each other. Right. So no, I do, I do see the image. Yeah. Oh, uh, that's good. I think that's good. It looks very really good. Hey, so instead of painting today, uh -huh. I was thinking that I might just eat soup. You could eat soup, yeah. From... A bowl while it's spinning. That sounds nice. That sounds very nice. Huh. I've never eaten spinning food. That seems quite odd that you would never have tried doing that in all of your years of spinning. That you would make the bowl and just disregard the spinning. Well, it's hard to see. Maybe I can adjust the video. Here. If I put my spoon down into it, it builds up. It's much easier. I no longer have to scoop through. The but is that bowl um, glazed yet and fired? Yes. Yeah, this is, this is a bowl my friend Lydia made. Huh. Okay, cool. That's cool. That's acceptable. I have to find black. I'm painting with black today. Say what? I said I'm painting with black today. Ooh. I had the idea of maybe painting with a single color, but instead I have these teapots that I started making the other day, the other day. And they're the you first know, I, have, I have a really quick what? idea. I have a quick idea. Yeah. I think if I put headphones into this computer, then you'll be able to see that one while I keep the microphone on. I think. Maybe not. I'm going to give this a try. Brilliant. Hi, Ham. Hey, Virginia. Hello. How's it going? Good, you? Pretty good, pretty good. Hey, do you know who Jessica Stockholder is? Yeah. yeah. I had a, um, a studio visit with her, or not a studio visit. All right, here goes. I'm going to try like this and this. Is that, is that, no, that's no, not that's, Okay, can't do that. She wrote a really great essay called The Swiss Cheese Field and Sculpture Mango that I really love. Huh. I would love to read that. Um, yeah. She was really sweet. Uh, seems really giving and supportive in a lot of ways. Um, I feel that I kind of fucked up uh, because I did something kind of quickly. Is this? What? Oh, okay. Is this? Pigments. Mars black. All right, that's what I'm talking about. Um, I can email you and show you, but I made this piece, the cubed piece that I'm always talking about. Do you remember that? Who? Cubed is where I've got three galleries of the same size and shape. Yeah. Um, well, I made that piece, but I made it in a school setting. And uh, I showed it, and it was all broadcasting live. And um, I was like in such a rush putting it out. There. But you didn't share. You didn't share the link. What's that? So, yes, it was tech. You were using the broadcasting live feature, but you didn't have a shareable link. Yeah, you that's didn't true. Link it out there. 
So you were just yeah. using the live feature to record it, which I think is important. So it's not that other people could see them, it's just that you were recording them was the issue. Yeah, 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 yeah. Which, um, you know, continues to come up. All right, I guess I'll try some gum Arabic. Um, she's very famous. Yeah, that's what I think. Although truthfully, she's really famous amongst like people like us, but like my mom would not know of her. Oh, right, um, but among artists. Only yeah, artists, yeah, no, absolutely. And I've heard great things. Like um, Stephen Garrett Duyer had her when he was at Yale and talked like, and same with Mike Smith too, has talked about her as well of being like really great and uh, in so many ways. Does she come oh, to your school? What's that? Did she come to your school? She did. She came for the crits and then I showed the work in the crit. She's the head of the, um, the like visual arts department at the University of Chicago, which is a very similar program to here. But uh, yeah, I mean, basically I was working on this project that I wanted to do for so long. And uh, then I showed it and it just had this fatal flaw of being like, well, there's a few fatal flaws to it. But, um, but yeah, basically it kind of, it kind of tanked, but uh, I mean, not a completely bad way, but it was just uh, kind of a bummer that it worked out. So Sometimes yeah, that's true. Be like, oh, that tanks. Never going to do that again. Yeah, I mean, I'd say I think the idea was really good. Um, I think your intentions were really good with it. I think that what it reveals, though, are kind of like it's like the politics of recording someone and yeah. the legality of all of that, and and really exposing where you know you yourself might not think there to be an issue and someone else goes, well, you know, I really feel like there's something here that is uh, invading my privacy. Yeah. So, I don't know, I don't think it's, like, so basically you say, like, okay, well, can I do this without? Hi. I like your painting. Oh, you like my painting? Yeah, it looks great. Thank like, you. Okay. Can I do this uh, without those issues or are, are those privacy invasions, is that like part of it? Is your goal to make people feel comfortable and bring them together through these cubes or? You haven't really let him tell us what the flaws were. Oh, I've already talked with him about this. But yes, go on, tell the flaws. Explain the project for the audience, will you? Um, yeah, sure. So there are three, maybe I could put it up on the computer screen, even. Um, can you see my other computer at all, the one that I'm looking into right now? Yes, I see it in the bottom corner, but it won't pop up to take up the whole screen. Oh, interesting. So it will only work if I then mute my phone and unmute this computer. But that computer is the one that's hosting, correct? It is. It is, which is okay. No, it's very important. Um, yeah, yeah, it's very important to have that. No, it's very um, important that the hosting computer not be the primary one that you are looking through. Oh, really? Why is that? Because you're getting the perspective the perspective we're recording is the perspective of the host computer. So we pop up and down. So if you're yeah. recording from yours, you would just stay in the corner and I would be on the video for the entire recording. So I wonder, are we, if someone else goes to watch this right now, are they watching our recording pop in and out? Yes. Huh. But right now, as I talk to you, we're not popping in and out. Uh, we should be on the host computer. 
if someone were watching this via a live link, they would be seeing what you can see on the host computer. Um, I'm trying to pull this up. I mean, I don't see what's wrong with what you're saying necessarily. I'm not saying anything is wrong. So, uh, check this out. I'll, um, I guess I'll turn the mic off on one computer and turn it on on another. Does that seem cool or does that just seem lame? What are you showing me? The video of your piece? Yeah. I can do it. Well, why don't we talk about it and you work on your painting? Or <laughs> do you want to show it? Uh, well, I'd like to show it. It might make more sense. Well, here, I'll just explain, I guess. So, um, using three... Well, I've wanted to do this piece for a long time, which involves three different gallery spaces that are all the exact same size and shape. Um, with the thought of an interest in kind of the oddity of perceived individuality, um, and how, in a particular art context, this kind of individuality or thoughts of a creative class are really just um, kind of a rehashing of thoughts. And inside of that, I, I think like a, a fuck, um, an issue of culture. Things like leaking on my computer. What's happening? Um, so I have this like little like um, water spot in my studio where water leaks down from the ceiling from like a an old pipe. It's not so I great. Love that. Yeah. Anyway, um, I think that is the case in every graduate studio. There's at every school in the country. There's the obligatory leak, and it has so. to destroy the art. Yeah. Um, anyway, uh, I'm not really using three gallery spaces here. I was just using three art spaces. Um, in, yeah. Instead of being interested around this, like, um, this high-end art culture, uh, instead I started considering critiquing the uh, academic's context of critique. Yeah. Um, and uh, basically what happened was people got into this situation and tried to communicate, but couldn't. Um, Why couldn't? They were uh, They, like, they, well, they tried to. They could have had they worked hard enough at it, I guess. But for a number of reasons, I, I didn't set up a situation in a well enough or in a considered enough way. Um, but uh, I, um, yeah, I basically brought people into, so to explain the piece more, there are three gallery spaces at the school that are pretty similar in size and shape that I then projected onto them um, using video from three different computers, those spaces in real time with one another in a similar way to what we're doing right now, a YouTube like live event. Um, but you had, so is this nine when projectors you, and four? This is, this is three projectors and on each computer screen, the three, the three live broadcasts are being shown. One of the, the live broadcast of the space that you're in at that time. Another is a space uh, um, you know, across the hall that's happening at that time as well. And the third is another space down the hall. Um, yeah. It's also all at the same time. Um, and when you walk in, you see all three screens and they don't quite make sense. And then after 12 seconds, you notice yourself walking in one of the screens and you realize that that is the screen of like what's going on. Um, and- Oh, you said a delay? What's that? You made a delay? 
uh, I didn't actually make the delay. The delay occurs on its own. And I think that's a really interesting part of this, but maybe something that doesn't need to happen as much. Um, but uh, but if you had a different internet connection and different computers in a different space, it would have a different delay? Um, yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, well, well, actually, what happens is, as we're recording now, if someone wants to comment, on what we're doing, they're actually seeing this 12 seconds into the future. They're not seeing it as it's being broadcast live, basically. There's always a 12 second delay in order for it to maintain that, um, the memory that it's collecting, uh, which I think is very- That's true in some... every uh, YouTube live video? Yeah, uh, well, I mean, I guess so. I actually truthfully haven't tried other live stream programs to see what their delay is like, but I, I would I would wager that they would all be, they would have at least some delay. Right. But, um, I mean, that, that was actually a part that I took interest in. Yeah. Uh, and thought it was kind of weird and interesting, but also something that kind of mimics my own issues of being slow with taking in information. Um, I don't think you are. You don't think I'm slow with taking information in? No. I think I am. Um, and I think this is uh, something that comes up again and again with me. Um, I mean, so the other thing. To that, what? I don't think, I, I don't think that, that um, I don't think that this is an uncommon issue to come up, but I do think that I have been like really uh, hesitant to, I think that my ability to uh, learn in a classroom setting has really been complicated by uh, issues and slowly. Um, but yeah, it can easily turn into, um, you know, a way uh, of uh, pathologizing uh, people. And I don't think that's right, but I do think that there's something to be said for being aware of it and realizing how it functions and what occurs. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's a situation that uh, I have. Um, at the same time, though, there are lots of things that I'm very good at that are different from that. So. Like marathon running. Like marathon running, yeah. No, Hamilton does um, not regard himself as a good reader. Yes. What's that? I would say your discipline. Like, okay, let's yeah. let's say that your uh, processing speed for information is slower than the average uh, individual with the same education and. Uh, upbringing as yourself. Uh, yeah. I think that one, that is only one measure, and I think that all ways that you might be able to determine that measure are going to be flawed to some degree. And I also think that, yeah, it, smarts are a total... Um, it's, it's about how all of these things fit together, much more so than it is about any one thing. I would just say, right, no, I, I know he's not saying he isn't smart. Um, but I don't know. I just don't, I don't think you deserve the pity card. The pity card? Oh, yes, yeah, certainly. Who does? Um, Me. I want it. 
give it to me. Yeah, yeah, and um, I mean, I don't mean to take this down the rabbit hole or that rabbit hole of pity or anything, uh, which is why I say that like this is a problem that a lot of people have, and something that a lot of people don't get diagnosed at all, or or are even aware of it. And I think that sometimes that can um, that can really trap people uh, in their daily life and how they live. Um, and other people aren't, you know, other people, um, you know, uh, it doesn't, it doesn't face them or they encounter it in other ways. Like, um, like with discipline, like I would say for you, like whatever challenge it is that you might have, it doesn't really matter if you're not like the fastest processing power. If you have a attention span that can, uh, override that. Yeah, you know, I mean, like when I think about you and the way you're able to commit yourself to something. Um, awesome. Yeah, yeah, totally. But that's a total at, superpower. At what point is that an attribute of, um, you know, of having, uh, you know, this specific neurology? Um, Or a specific, at what point does the makeup of our brains dictate how we act in the world? I think and, at all points it does. Yeah, and I agree. I, um, which is why I, I don't think it's a legitimate issue to consider. Um, and also I think that that's like really at the root of a lot of this stuff is the, like this whole issue of individuality and how individual individuality takes place in the art world and how we navigate through the world it, and why people act in the ways that they do is really not necessarily as um, the personal initiative of the individual as simply an individual, but really is composed of many more little facets where we are, um, you know, uh, we have so many things that make up our selfhood and subjectivity that are out of our control and are not of our free will. Um, well, yeah, I mean, a lot of people will say that your only true self is like in a meditative state because everything that we use to identify ourselves within our sort of waking life, or it's all learned through our environment. Yeah. You know, like, even your subconscious is the result of your experience. Yeah. Half and half. I don't know about if that's completely true. Oh, I didn't say it was completely true. I just said a lot of people say it. Um, yeah, I mean, I also think that our subconscious can come from, you know, certain... Um, can come from the experiences of our parents and our parents' parents. Uh, I have friends whose great-grandparents have been in the Holocaust, and I wonder how much uh, going through an experience like that, or even years and years of, you know, millennia of Jews being kind of uh, outcast or enslaved or had, having something horrible happen, how that can affect how then they then... Um, you know, act in the world. Uh, right. But I don't know, that's, that's a very controversial thing. What is? And talking about, uh, you know, why people act in a certain way and stipulating that it's based on some sort of historical event. I mean, there's no way to really prove that other than to say that we inherit our anxieties. I mean, yeah, I don't know if genetically that's the case, but culturally, I'd say that's certainly the case. Or I'd be really surprised if it wasn't. But yeah, so now I've got to figure out what to show for the next critique, and it might just be me talking about the piece and showing it again. 
Yeah, I mean, so we went and saw Mark Bradford give a talk the other day. Oh, really? Yeah. How was that? It was, it was great. Mark uh, Bradford. I'm trying to recall who Mark Bradford what? I'm trying to recall Mark what? Bradford. Who is Mark Bradford? Uh, currently representing the US of A at the Venice Biennale. Oh, yeah. Mark Bradford. Did he come to Detroit? Yeah. Oh, that's cool. That's great. Yeah, it's great. He, he gave a really great lecture. And it's just really interesting to think about how experience plays into, you know, someone's work, someone's life story. And it's like he just has such a great story and he's so great at telling it. And he has such good intentions in his making. It's just interesting to think about, like, I don't know, I wonder if, like, as a privileged white male, if it's possible for me to make, like, really great artwork, almost. Like, in, because almost, like, I, I have a family where if I, if my work didn't sell and nothing came out of it, I would have support you know um yeah. like i have people who like wouldn't let me starve and in that way it's like really difficult for me to really actually take a risk doing anything yeah uh, and i guess something about what makes the story great it tends to be you know when you overcome everyone likes to root for the underdog and i think that part of what makes art great is when it has a great story, you know, because you, you dig into it. Um, and, and then people tell the story because it was a great story, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I don't know, it was, it was just so great to hear him talk. And the other thing that I was thinking about a lot during it was, you know, he spent a lot of his time explaining this project he did in Venice as part of the Biennale where he worked with this prison this Italian prison, and these, uh, basically these prisoners had formed this collective and were, um, you know, coming together to uh, make these bags that they were selling, and this sales basically funded the collective's continued activity of doing this thing, and it gave them a way to you know, empower themselves and connect themselves to the world outside. Yeah. And he thought that's really beautiful, and he basically just, like, used his platform to further enable this collective. And they made a, a space, and he sort of started doing this whole project, like, a year beforehand. But what I thought was so interesting about it was, like, it wasn't really a social practice project in that he wasn't really claiming authorship or even saying that he was the artist or anything like that, you know? It was just that he wanted to do something as part of that community because that's part of what, like, being an artist is to him. Yeah. Um, and it was so interesting to, like, not hear it explained as an artwork and it just being this activity and that by doing this activity, he sort of justifies in part some of his other more selfish things, even though his work is all sort of political and geared toward, you know, sort of sharing a message anyways. But it's just interesting to, to see it talked about in that way, especially after I've been like, I don't know, deep into researching and understanding social practice at different points. Um, where did you see him talk? The DIA. Oh, interesting. Wow. Go DIA. No, it was not a pink hamster. Yeah. Yeah, Penny Stamps has been shown some good 
bringing in good lectures as well. I just haven't been able to make it there. Yeah, we missed Chris though. Good. I don't know her work very well. What are you painting, Ham? What are you doing? Can you see this at all? Yes, I see it. It looks great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, shit. Henry? Yeah. Hey. Give me, give me, hey. give me hey. a shout. Hey. Shout, okay, cool. Shout, let it all out. What? What? Um, yeah, well, that's great. I'm glad the DIA is getting some good people to talk. Were there a lot of people there? Yeah. Yeah, I think it was fairly well attended. Um, yeah, yeah, we saw a bunch of people there, we saw Zeb sitting in front of us, we saw, I don't know, who did we see? Everybody, uh, Dylan Spaseky, I didn't see Rebecca. <laughs> to really consider everything that was going on in Mark Bradford's work. It was a really cool pavilion, but I think most people went to it and were like, well, what's this about? And it was obvious that it had something behind it, but it was hard to tell what. Um, right. But that was just my experience. I thought the work looked really strong. So. Um, the fact that you couldn't tell what it was about, you felt found uh, difficult. Um. Yeah, I mean, there's some work that hits like really quickly, and then there's some work that takes a while to kind of like come out. Uh, and his was one that uh, didn't offer any immediate explanations of itself, which isn't a bad thing. Um. But yeah, just uh, like he showed, I don't know if he showed you this work called Niagara, um, which was of a, a you know, uh, a black kid in like South LA and he's walking away from the camera. Yeah. And, um, there was no clue as to what was going on. It was just a kid walking away and showing that over and over again. And then later on you read that, um, you know, like it's uh, talking about a famous film where Marilyn Monroe walks away from the camera at the end of the movie or something. Um, that wasn't, I, I mean, what, he may have pulled that reference, but when he was talking about it, the talk with regard to it was like, a lot about you know, uh, black bodies in public spaces and um, you know this sort of epidemic of violence and the fact that you might assume that something horrible was going to happen to him just because it's a black guy on on film. Huh. I thought that was that was sort of something I took from it. I, I think he kind of mentioned that a little bit. Yeah. Virginia says she has no recollection of it. Yeah. 
in your sense, you just remember him talking about considering black bodies in public spaces. Become vulnerable in public spaces. Henry, what are you working on right now? I just put a spout onto a teapot. Oh, that's nice. That looks nice. And yeah, I mean, there are some like the ways that my marks get made when I'm working or like with the clay. It's, it's all very painterly. Um, and then, you know, the way that I sort of wind up thinking about applying glaze to it, it's very much sort of like, right now I'm sort of stretching a loaded canvas that might get used someday, and like as a pot. And so I want it to be able to do that because I think that's what's exciting about it being a pot. Hmm. Um, and so there's a certain amount of concentration that goes into like, thinking about ergonomics and the actual sort of like uh, engineering of a teapot and how that thing goes about then being able to act as a teapot. Um, but uh, there's also sort of all these different types of touch that you end up having with the material as you're forming it and then depending on sort of how you wait. So like, I'm working with the clay here in a way that would be sort of like, classically, it's too soft for me to be sort of doing a lot of the things that I'm doing to it. Huh. Or it is definitely on the soft end. And so I am making marks or distorting the form in ways that would be avoidable if I sort of followed more of the classic methodology about how to make a teapot. Um, so, but I'm being very deliberate with how I like position my hands and, and hold it as I am making those marks. So they all sort of become, uh, sort of visible in a way, but not sloppy. Yeah. And it's like a, there's an interesting line that exists there that I don't seem to have an understanding of on a canvas, but that I feel really confident with on a, on a pot. And in terms of us Sunday painting, I do really feel like I'm, I'm making paintings. Yeah, I would say that your work is very painterly. And so, paint-like. Um, yeah, and so I, I figured if we're gonna do Sunday painting and I have these pots in progress, maybe I can just uh, paint with, with you this guy. Yeah. By the Are you guys getting excited for your show that's coming up? Yes. Virginia had our friend Allie come by this morning and take a picture. Yeah. Of work. By the way, um, for all of those people listening out there on the internet um, that may not, uh, may or may not include like all of the Russian hackers out there that are getting ready to hack all of us. Um, uh, yeah. Well, props, props to Allie on a really beautiful photo essay. Holy shit. It's amazing. Yeah. Wasn't, isn't that great? Yeah. It looks so awesome. Um, and that's like right in my neighborhood. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. Did that get around in Chicago, I imagine? Did that what? Did that article get around in Chicago? I'm not sure. Honestly, I'm so disconnected from 
everything right now. I'm just in school and learning, basically. I'm not really going out and socializing, and I'm also trying to spend enough time with Rachel and uh, running up against some dead ends in terms of like being able to complete my schoolwork. So busy days for me. Yeah, that's that's fine. Yeah. You no, know, sometimes completing the work isn't what's most important. Sometimes yeah. it's about grasping the idea. Yeah, that's true. Though I also think there's sometimes yeah, it's a hard thing to judge because I'm, I can be a perfectionist. Uh, you know, getting around that. However, there are some times where the work actually requires certain things of it. Yeah, did you see that? No. What'd you do? My lid was stuck on, so I did a mouth-to-mouth -mouth with the teapot spout huh. and blew into it and disconnected that lid. Huh. It was it was thrilling. Um, yeah, anyways. Uh, you know what's funny about this is we're both kind of going back to our preferred mediums. Like I'm yeah. not in your making pots. I've been drawing on my pots as of late a whole bunch in ways that you, I think, would really enjoy. Um, because, you know, this whole process, the thing that I'm doing right now, like making it, I have a lot, it's, a very, it's very loaded. Like there are all sorts of ways I can think about these textures and shapes and the history behind all of that. And then my sort of glazing process ends up, is, is really sort of, a, and firing processes give a lot of, like there's a lot left to chance there. Yeah. And sometimes it's really like great what you get, but I have a lot of times, a, a lot of trouble sometimes taking ownership of it. Yeah. I'd be like, I made that. Cause like, like it doesn't really feel like I did it. But I've been drawing on these pieces with a Dremel tool afterwards and inscribing huh. into that glaze. And I've been like drawing and writing and just like, giving different ways to access it outside of uh, sort of just the abstraction of, of the glaze and the, so the history of the form. So, yeah, that's been pretty cool. I can show you some in a second. Yeah, sure. It looks like you put a handle on. What's that? Did I just put a handle on? Oh, my teapot has a handle now. Put a bird on it. Yeah, I'm not a put a bird on it kind of guy. I'll just put a handle on it and then call that, call that it. Oh. That's a Detroit clay teapot right there. First. Uh -huh. In the new studio. Oh, yeah. Wait, how is the house? It's crazy. We're in it. You're right next to the wood stove right now. It's oh, rock. fuck. You guys got a wood stove. You're going to heat the house that way? We're heating the studio that way. Look at Virginia. Hey, Virginia. She's sitting next to the stove with the dog. Wow. So, so yeah, things are pretty good. Yeah. 
Cool. Things are heating up. That's Virginia said. Um, have y'all been really cold? Uh, yeah. Last week we got our heat going though, so we're good. We're good. We That's were a little good. cold for a moment though. I remember so. my first, like winter or two or maybe three in Detroit were just fucking cold because I didn't have heat. I had heat in one of the places, but it was like fucked up heat. And yeah, it's really hard. I really do not like being in the cold, uh, especially when I like work outside in the daytime in the cold and then go home to like a cold house. Why did you do that? Just didn't have it. Didn't have I heat. Think did it you did it so you could make art is the truth i mean yeah. you put your studio practice before everything and you're like fuck making money or having a job or anything i'm just gonna like <laughs> yeah but... I'm just gonna make art as much as possible that was what i perceived at least yeah it was pretty stupid <laughs> um, is that stupid i mean could I have asked, like, my parents to help me pay for stuff? Yes. And should I have done that? Maybe I should have. I don't know. I mean, there's something, uh... There's... That's the grit. What's that? You got grit now. Yeah. Uh, it's kind of like a fake grit, I would say. I don't know. It's a, it's a hard thing to say, like, um... It's such a silly path. Uh, there's also like the whole romanticizing of it. I think it's like kind of a joke. Um, you know, like even all of this, like uh, shop at the market and eat local food, you know, at first was kind of a cool idea, but then it, it was just totally co-opted into a greater like uh, narrative of like, the economy that seems to really fuck over its citizens. Right. <sighs> right. So, yeah, I mean, I think uh, at the time I didn't realize, like, I knew I was kind of being a cog, but I didn't know how I was being utilized or how, like, that. Um, what, what were you doing that was cog like? By living in a house without heat? Uh, yeah, and being like an educated white kid who, you know, from like a middle class family moving to Detroit, bombed out Detroit, and like doing my art practice. I mean, it's a. You it's not enterprise. cool, but it's also kind of bullshit, too. And it feeds into this narrative of like what artists should be like, which is why when I hear you talk about like um, Mark Bradford's story and him talking about stuff, uh, however legitimate, I still think is a, a narrative. Um, and uh, I guess I'm, I'm just wary of narratives. Uh, because I think that at the end of the day, it's this whole thought of like taste and where taste comes from. It, it's a uh, you know, is, is uh, something to be questioned. Man, there are so many things within that that I totally disagree with. Uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, like, number one, by participating in Detroit in the way that you did, you did not perpetuate gentrification or that romantic narrative of Detroit, you worked super hard and moved into an abandoned house and fixed it up. And that is, that is not the Detroit narrative that is getting so hot. The, the so hot idea is like, it's only 500 bucks, you can come live here and party all you want. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, that, I think what you're talking about is like 
I think you actually participated in your community in a very real way. Uh, and I don't think any of your neighbors like had ill feelings about your being there. Yeah. 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 I mean, and I, I think that's what matters. And then like, I don't think you drove up the housing prices in that community. Um, I don't know. I don't, I, I just don't see what you did as perpetuating that at all. I see what you did as being a really, really genuine act in an effort to pursue, pursue a creative life that is a really, really hard thing to pursue yeah. in an economy that doesn't support it. Yeah. Uh, and so you moved to a place where you didn't have to participate in a traditional economy in order to maintain yourself while you developed yourself as an artist. That yeah. seems savvy and yeah. it seems totally justifiable. Uh -huh. Yeah, it, I mean, I, yeah, I don't know. I, uh, thanks for saying that. Um, I guess it's just, it's a weird thing. There's so many fucked up aspects to an economy and how it works. And, um, I mean, yeah, there's in one sense, the, um, the immediate gut punch of the Red Bull House of Art gang, um, that is like doing stuff that's just simply interesting. Um, and not realizing that you're feeding into actually this like uh, art gallery initiative of just making Red Bull look cool, which is another debatable thing of like, well, so what? If I had a good time, does it really matter? Um, but I don't think that's debatable. I think it's just like, dude, you're just you're just getting used. Um, think so? Because I. Yeah, I would say that Red Bull, as far as like what they do as a big company, like I don't think all big companies are inherently bad. They have a lot of money. They have a, they have a lot of money. They're giving some of it to the arts. The question is like, is it just for show in relationship to the amount of money that they have? Or, you know, is it genuine philanthropy? Um, and I think that that's a hard call, probably. I don't have the, the numbers to be able to say that, but I, I can say that I do think Red Bull actually puts on a bunch of weird shit that is pretty commendable um, as far as like big companies go. Is this a new initiative on their part, or are you talking about stuff that even happened while I was there? Because yeah, I, yeah, with, well, like, I mean, I'm not saying like, the art that tends to operate in that space is my cup of tea or anything like that. I mean, I guess I just think it fuels this, um, just, I, I think it mirrors the actual, uh, the economy of the city as entertainment. Like come here to get your kicks, you know, off. This is like an interesting and weird place. And, um, you know, not, we're not thinking as much about the people who actually live there or the implications of uh, the work inside of an economy. I mean, I'm not saying that I always be so conscious of that. I think that art should just happen. But I think that when you have someone supporting you because they, are, they want to use you for um, the spinning of their uh, like product, that's actually a very tangible product, not just like a gallery wanting to have a certain credibility but like having a, you know, a sports drink that you're trying to sell. Um, I don't know, I, I can't, I, yeah. And, and the, the art that came out of it, I never found interesting or compelling. I thought that it was just very flashy. I don't think that's what matters though. That's just like, and I don't think whether or not you like it is really important either. I do think that it assists in fueling the 
com the art community in Detroit and diversifying it to a certain extent. And um, it could be an access point, you know, like, yeah, what if what if you were a Red Bull House of Art resident artist? What would you what would you do? Like, there's probably some way you could spin it where they would be both interested in something you were doing, and uh, and and you could sort of covertly move their position into one which is more sort of uh, conceptual or abstract or or social or whatever, I, I don't think there is, uh, and it's not the same, like, I don't actually know anything about the Red Bull House of Art. I went to a few parties, like, four years ago, um, and I do know that I have a few friends who have done it that had nothing but good things to say about it, honestly. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. Let me, let me be right back. I need some warm water. Hey, Henry. Yeah. I have to go. Oh, okay. Well, that works great. Um, yeah, I hate to go when we start talking about stuff. Maybe we should make these things more common. Yeah. Yeah, I miss you, man. Um, yeah, dude, I miss you guys. What are you working on? What are you working on besides that cubed piece and besides this TV show that we're making right now? Oh, there's lots of stuff. I mean, really, what I'm trying to do right now is compare the cube piece to the rainbow piece and talk about them and what's the difference or what's the link and trying to trying to just get a better sense of what's going on in the work. Um, right. But at the same time, too, uh, there are like. There are people coming through, like this guy Fred Moten is coming through. Yeah. He's really cool. He wrote a book called The Undercommons, um, which is, uh, you should check it out, or I'll, I'll send you a link to it. Um, okay. I think you would take interest in it, although it's, yeah, it's pretty intense um, for reads, although it also reads kind of easily, too. But, um, yeah, he's coming next week, and so I have to read, like, uh, a book of his that's, you know, like 300 pages or something. Fuck. Um, so yeah, it's like that and then a bunch of other readings. It's just, it's a lot. It keeps me moving. Good. Um, but uh, yeah, I actually have to meet someone in like five minutes. Okay. Go um, meet. I love you. Call great to have you. Let's have you soon. I'll give you a call later in the week, maybe. Okay. Soon. Yeah, we okay. can Sunday paint more often, too. Yeah, yeah, because Sunday painting can happen on any day. That's true. Um, okay, well, I'm going to go. Okay. Uh, let me grab my phone. Um, Good to yeah. hear you. I, uh, yeah, I love you guys, and I'll talk to you soon. Love you, too, man. Okay, take care. Bye.